you saw something here when it came to these small distressed communities in Appalachia and similarities that were in all of these towns and then similar ways of dealing with the problems. So first, can you just describe sort of what were what were some of the problems they shared that sort of preceded the opioid crisis? So one of the the factors about where the crisis first broke out was the fact that Purdue Pharma bought data that showed them which communities were sort of rife to be exploited by their products. That is, they picked the communities in America, these tended to be distressed rural towns where the jobs were going away. And these were places that had furniture factory making, coal mining, logging, fishing, um, so you first see the the crisis break erupting in places like Southwest Virginia, West Virginia, rural Maine, because Purdue kn- knew that doctors in those communities were already prescribing competing opioids that uh, at a higher rate. And with their um, FDA label that we now know is quite in question, they went out and they tried with the reps, they tried to flip the uh, doctors from prescribing Percocet, Vicodin, Lortab to OxyContin, which they said was safer because of this continuous uh, release mechanism. Mm-hmm. And they got they, they they got the doctors to flip thanks to that FDA insert, which was completely bought and paid for by Purdue Pharma um, to the great expense of really lower not even, I mean, maybe lower to middle uh, income Americans to begin with, and then it's spread and spread and spread. I know you write about um, a study that took a look at the the life expectancy of people in these regions um, and how like the difference between the bottom fifth uh, in terms of income and wealth and the top fifth in income and wealth in in this country is huge. It's something like a, a, a difference of 13 years in life expectancy. And so these people really, they, they've been overlooked by a system that has been focused on globalization, that's been trying to kill coal, um, and no one's been paying any attention to them. And then Purdue Pharma did and managed to manipulate their very doctors to sort of turn on them without understanding that's what they were doing. Right. And that was a real double whammy. If you've already lost the majority of your job, some of the communities I was reporting on from my first book, Factory Man, which came out in 2014, which is about the aftermath of globalization. As I was wrapping up that reporting, I was starting to hear things like, we've got a heroin crisis in Martinsville, Virginia. We're talking like a tiny town about an hour south of me here in Roanoke, Virginia. And I didn't understand it at the time, nor did most journalists, that the OxyContin story was so related to the heroin epidemic story because they're Mm -hmm. basically chemical cousins. And when the drugs start to get harder to get, more expensive around 2010, 2012, you and I may not have known that OxyContin and heroin were chemical cousins, but the cartels did. And so they bring them in and start converting people Uh, to heroin because it's cheaper, it's easier to get. And they know that one's fear of becoming dope sick, that is this excruciating uh, feeling of withdrawal that they all say is like the worst flu times 100, uh, really is one hell of a good business model. And can you explain what the cartels, which we already know are evil, do to the drug in order to make sure the clientele gets hooked and keeps coming back? Well, first, they just I remember the story from a young woman named Tess Henry that I followed for Dope Sick, and she could pinpoint the month that the DEA started cracking down. Hydrocodone products had been upscheduled. I think it was like 2014. And she said all of a sudden she couldn't get the pills on the black market from her dealer. And so he personally showed her how to snort heroin which you think heroin, yuck, you know, if you're her, which she did at first, but really if you're snorting in a line, it was just the same as she had been snorting the pills. And once, because of, because with opioids, you, you need more and more in order not to get dope sick. Um, then when the snorting, the heroin didn't work, her dealer taught her how to shoot it up. And that, Mm. you know, times times a million across our country. That's the way it Mm -hmm. went down. And now we have fentanyl uh, poisoning the drug supply 
because it's smaller, more potent, and easier to smuggle in. Mm. The um, I, in the book you write about how they would they'll sort of pack the initial dose with um, some extras. And, and you get this big high and you love it. And then you come back and they lower the dosage in your next your next delivery. So then you start to get the feeling you, you need the next hit sooner. You pay more, you know, and it's, now they've got you. I mean, now you're now you're a customer for life. Is heroin a lot cheaper than Oxycontin? And I mean, obviously, you don't get a prescription for it. So you just get it like on the streets, but it's more accessible and it's cheaper. Absolutely. It's a lot cheaper. And forgive me, I don't remember exactly how much it's going for right now. But of course, fentanyl is in all of the drugs right now. So you're getting people overdosing uh, with cocaine that's laced with fentanyl, MDMA drugs. Um, And these are so much easier to get uh, on the black market than the treatment, the medicines Um, the medication assisted treatment that science says is the gold standard of care for treating Mm -hmm. people with opioid use disorder. I mean, that's, it's so much easier to just go out and get dope again, rather than it is to be treated like a human being with a medical condition in our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And so you get hooked on something like Oxycontin, thanks to Purdue and its fancy marketing skills and its manipulation of the FDA and doctors and its own sales reps. And then when you either run out of money or the ability to get more prescriptions, once the government cracked down on these, um, you know, pill pushers, um, then where are you? Because you're still addicted and you can't get your drug anymore. So you turn to heroin or you turn to fentanyl and you have a high likelihood of dying. I mean, that's the thing. So we, we didn't solve the opioid crisis by cracking down on some of these characters. No, absolutely. Or, nor did we solve the opioid crisis with by reducing prescriptions even. Um, a lot of people thought that would, um, you know, help with overdoses because, and maybe it, it, it does help with not starting new cases, but for the people who are already addicted, that horse is long out of the barn. 